Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the podcast, we talk about my road trip knives. Uh, we'll talk about a new knife in the state of the collection, in my collection, of course. And Laren Thomas comes out with his own powder metallurgy steel. We always knew that that was coming, uh, but it's finally here and it's been announced. Uh, but first on the show, as we like to do here, I'm going to do a pocket check. It's my first opportunity to show off a knife, in this case, two. Uh, today, I'm carrying something that I haven't carried in a long time, but when I first saw it come out in 2013 or so, I thought, oh my gosh, I already designed that knife. It, it reminded me so much of uh, this Filipino sword on the wall right here uh, that I had uh, already designed a couple of folders after that. And then I saw this, I just freaked and I bought it. Probably one of the first expensive knives I got. Uh, this is the Spyderco Uliza. It's designed by Ulrich Hennecke, a German police officer or former police officer and knife maker. And uh, he made this knife to be a, uh, a carry option or backup option when policing. And if you notice, it's a pretty big knife. It's got a four inch blade and it is or just slightly north of four inches, I believe. And uh, it's sort of in the line with their police models. OK, it doesn't really look like the Spyderco police model, but it's kind of got all the same hallmarks, very thin. Uh, Japanese made um, lock back here and G10, thin G10 handle scales and a nice long VG10 blade. In this case, it is this gorgeous recurve. I am a huge fan of the recurve, as you know, and I also like a pistol grip orientation on a blade because it on a knife because it makes thrusting easier. Uh, you know, it puts the point in line with your arm without having to torque your wrist in a, in a special way to get that point into where you want to go. So this knife uh, held a lot of fascination for me when it first came out and uh, got it, carried it quite a bit. And it's kind of been sitting in the, in the drawer for a while, uh, unnoticed. And I just noticed it last night and I decided I'm, I need to carry this knife again. By the way, it is hollow ground and, uh, you know, who doesn't love a hollow ground recurve? So Spyderco Uliza is my is my main carry today. And then another one that I rarely carry, if ever, uh, but this also caught my eye. You know, I've been away for a week, hadn't looked at my knife collection and then opened it up and it was like having a brand new collection. Uh, so today I'm going to carry this also. This is my SOG Terminus XR. This is the Knife Rights Edition. I got this last year when I, when the Knife Junkie channel donated uh, some money to the Ultimate Steel um, fundraising and drawing event. This is a super sharp knife. I love, and I'll say that again, I love this clip point shape. You know, uh, SOG, I run hot and cold with SOG, but I think that, uh, well, they've found their compass again, and uh, the knives they've been making have been steadily increasing uh, in quality since the old ones. Now, now this one is one of the first years uh, that they made the XR lock. That's their version of the bar lock or uh, axis lock, first created by Benchmade. And I have a couple of other SOGs with this XR lock that work excellently. This is the first model that they put this uh, XR lock on. And they seemed to, uh, well, they worked it out over the next couple of years. Uh, they got the able lock to be more parallel and to um, deploy and retract a little bit better. As you can see here, the bar of the bar lock in this is a bit crooked. Um, so it, the action isn't as good as some of the later XR locks, but in any case, this is a great little knife and uh, it has some sentimental value with that Knife Rights uh, logo on it. And uh, today I have some boxes to cut up, some work I didn't do before we left on vacation. And so I have to get to that today. And I've never really used this knife, so I'm gonna see how this works out. 
hopefully it doesn't rub off that uh, emblem, uh, that uh, Knife Rights logo. If it does, well, I'm going to I'm going to stop using it. But that is my carry for today, the Spyderco Uliza and the Sog Terminus XR. Two excellent and overlooked knives in my collection. Speaking of knives, <laughs> which is what we do here, uh, I want to mention that this coming Thursday, which is tomorrow night, uh, we have Thursday Night Knives. During Thursday Night Knives, we will have the Gentleman Junkie giveaway for the month of April. And this month, I've been talking about it quite a bit, uh, we are giving away the Kubi Raven, this beautiful, beautiful knife that uh, Dave, this old sword blade reviews, who we just interviewed, uh, donated to the channel. Um, I'm a huge fan of this knife, only having had it in hand for a couple of weeks now. It is, man, it just punches way out of its weight class and price point. Uh, it's It's got a beautiful blade shape. It's, what is this, D2, I think? Oh, no, this is AUS 10, AUS 10, uh, like Cold Steel is now running on some of their budget blades. Not budget, high value blades. Their budget stuff is even lower than that. AUS 10 is a, is a huge improvement over AUS 8, and uh, I'm interested to see how Kubi does their heat treat on this steel. Uh, this blade, as I mentioned, uh, this knife, as I mentioned, kind of seems to punch out of its price point because this is uh, a fifty-dollar knife retail, but you have this incredible um, burlap micarta, green burlap micarta, a very classy way of uh, putting the logo on there, right on the pivot. You have a sterile blade on this side, and then you have the Jelly Jerry maker's mark on this side. Jelly Jerry is a designer uh, who we've seen a lot of his designs come out through Tucson Knife uh, Company. This knife also has a sculpted pocket clip and a very, very robust, um, ow, damn, close that on my pinky, very robust liner lock and thick liners that have some weight reduction added. So this is going to be the Gentleman Junkie giveaway knife for April. We'll be doing that on Thursday Night Knives uh, on uh, this week. And just look at that blade. Very thin, very slicey, very capable in a uh, very ergonomic package. I looked at this and I thought, mm, it's going to feel in hand like the uh, bad monkey. And I, I like the Southern Grind knives. I love how they look, but I just don't really care for the ergonomics. Uh, that curved back strap is a turnoff to me. But on this knife, it actually works very well. And I think that's because of this surface here. So in any case, uh, tune in, check it out. 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We go live on Thursday nights and we will be spinning the wheel of destiny with all of our gentlemen junkies on that, uh, on that wheel. And Hopefully someone who's never won before will win. We've had a couple of occasions where people have won twice. It's just random. It's internet random. Uh, we use an internet uh, uh, sort of a random number generator that's on a wheel. And uh, it looks pretty cool. So tune in for that. So as I've mentioned, and as this show is titled, uh, we went on a road trip this past week uh, down to Florida. And what do you think I did before we went? I checked the Florida knife laws and decided that Florida is in my future at some point because, man, do their knife laws rock. You can basically carry whatever you want. You have to be careful about concealment. Uh, I think you can't conceal anything under four inches or, I mean, anything over five inches, but everything else goes. And then uh, there's a lot of open carry. Like the only kind of knife you can't have there is one of those Soviet era ballistic knives, you know, where the blade shoots out uh, like a projectile. Uh, who has one of those anyway? And if they have it, who's actually carrying it? So really, it's a very, very permissive state. And I've been hearing a lot about Florida just through uh, the podcasts I listen to and some news outlets. And um, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but two things about Florida. When some insane crazy news story pops up, someone does something absolutely bizarre and crazy. It's usually in Florida, casting no aspersions. I'm from Ohio. A lot of crazy stuff comes out of Ohio too. But uh, the second thing is that, uh, well, man, they're just, uh, 
they're just way ahead down there. So uh, I saw a funny t-shirt while I was down there. You know, we went to a theme park. I'm not going to disclose what the theme park is because uh, I'm going to be talking about security in a, in a little while. And I don't want anyone to get in trouble. But uh, I saw a really um, it was a very interesting cross-section of people at this theme park. I mean, you, you saw people from all over the country, uh, all different um, all different types. And I saw a, a great t-shirt that said, I am 1,776% positive that no one will be taking my guns. And my wife and I saw it at the same time, and we burst out laughing. I love that sentiment. I love that spirit. Uh, that's the American spirit, you know, spirit of independence and everything. But I just thought the verbiage was hilarious. 1,776% positive. No one's going to take my guns. Oh, hilarious. Um, so anyway, what was the second thing I was going to mention about Florida? There are a couple of really great knife makers down in Florida. Bastinelli Creations is down there. Uh, you have um, Randall Made Knives. I, and I want wanted to take a trip to Randall Made Knives because we were kind of in the Orlando area. Lots of theme parks there. You won't guess which one. And uh, didn't have time to go. Apparently, it's a little bit off the beaten track, a beaten path. And I, I just couldn't actually see telling my wife and daughters, I'll see you tomorrow. Have fun at the theme park. I'm going to check out an old knife shop. So I didn't do that, but uh, maybe next time. Uh, so also, speaking of traveling south, one more little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, I've gotten the go-ahead to go to Blade Show. So I will be going to Blade Show this year, and I am thrilled. Uh, the only... Um, the only down part is that Jim will not be joining me this year. Uh, I, I do believe he will be joining me next year, and we will go down as a tour de force together and uh, get to meet all of the fine people we've had, not only interviewing on the podcast, but people who have come on Thursday Night Knives. I'm excited to meet, and also just people who comment and people who I know watch the show. So I'm really excited, and I've decided I am not bringing a gob of money down uh, because I... <laughs> I, I could just see it evaporating uh, right quick. And um, so I'm just going to go down and talk to some people, meet some people, press the flesh, pass my card around, um, and just really uh, get to handle some knives I wouldn't have a chance to handle otherwise. And I'm very, very excited. Uh, Georgia is an awesome state also. I just spent, well, one night in Georgia on the way down. It was the first time I've ever been in that state. And uh, it also left an impression. So. Very, very, very excited to go down to Blade Show. Uh, coming up, we're going to get to Life Knife News, Knife Life News, and the state of the collection. Uh, but first, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And hit that notification bell and share this video if you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, also, if you're out there, check out our other shows. We have knife review videos. We have Thursday Night Knives, our, our Thursday night live stream, and our knife uh, junkie town halls where you get to meet and talk to knife personalities and makers. Uh, so that's always a big fun thing. Also, if you're interested in listening to this podcast elsewhere, you can find it on the podcatchers and uh, tell a friend about that. But be sure it's a knife friend. They'll say, why are you telling me about something called the Knife Junkie podcast? And lastly, if you want to support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Uh, the quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Uh, in case you missed it, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So we knew it would happen ever since we spoke to Laren Thomas on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 13. Uh, but I just saw it released on uh, Knife News that he has created his own powder metallurgy steel. And if you listened to the, the podcast with Laren Thomas or if you uh, follow him, you know that this man knows steel. His father uh, was a famous, is a famous Damascus maker. And so since a, at a very, uh, since a very young age, he's been interested in blade steels and in their chemical makeup and what makes them tick, what makes uh, some steels better at some things than others. And uh, let me just tell you, when we had a conversation on this show, 
a lot of what he said went over my head. I did a lot of nodding and yesing, uh, but really let him tell the story because uh, my knowledge of knife steel is is very cursory. And um, so we got the straight dope from him. Now, in reading this uh, interview with him, um, Ben Schwartz over at Knife News, I guess, uh, finds his information also uh, difficult enough to understand that he just posted the full interview he did with Laren on the web web uh, website. You should check it out. But he gets into what his goals were for this steel. And basically, he was looking to make a steel somewhat like Crewwear or M4, something that's non-stainless but behaves like a stainless steel, but also has a lot of the... Um, a lot of the um, appealing qualities of non-stainless, um, tight-grained steels. Uh, so high wear resistance, um, high toughness, but also capable of reaching a very high um, uh, Rockwell hardness. That's about where I'm going to leave it with this, because um, if I start talking vanadiums and cobalts and other type things, um, I am going to speak out of school here. But one funny thing in this interview you should check out on Knife News is he, he starts talking about how other people, um, you know, armchair metallurgists. I mean, this guy has a PhD in metallurgy. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, but he was talking about how arm armchair chair metallurgists, as he puts it, will sit down and say, well, I want extra vanadium for this and extra cobalt for that because I, I hear cobalt's an awesome element. Um, which I thought was kind of funny and a little bit snarky, basically saying, you know, people get used to hearing the words and seeing the percentages, uh, but they don't really know what they're talking about. Laren Thomas knows of what he's talking about. So uh, why don't you head over there uh, and and check it out. His new steel is called Magna Cut, which I love. I love the name Magna Cut. And um, it's going to be manufactured by uh, Crucible Steel, uh, they are the ones who have CPM before all of their steel names. So do yourself a favor and go check it out. And definitely do not go on my word. But Magna Cut looks like it's going to be an awesome steel. And not for nothing, he's already uh, exposed some production uh, companies to this steel. And they are very interested. And of course, uh, a number of custom knife makers are already um, champing at the bit to get their hands on Magna Cut, CPM Magna Cut Steel by Laren Thomas. All right, next, uh, we have a new knife brand coming from another uh, knife enthusiast, knife community member. I love this. You know I love these stories. You have people just like me, just like you, who are knife fanatics and uh, dream of making their own knives. You have a, a notebook full of sketches. Oh, I'd love to see this. And I'd make it in Crewwear and Micarta and all that. Well, some people actually make these dreams come true. Uh, and we have a British knife maker uh, who has come out with his new company, and it's called Who Knives. His name is Carl Pearson, and he's a lifelong enthusiast. And now he's creating uh, Who Knives for the UK knife market. How do you like that? The UK knife market, which is a very, very restricted place uh, in terms of knives. Um, as we know. Uh, but Carl Pearson has taken his love of modern knives with all of the trappings of modern knives, flippers, titanium, all of the <clears throat> all of the um, sort of key characteristics of modern knives that we love. And he has put it into a sub three inch bladed double detent flipper. And it's called the V1. It looks like a really good EDC blade. And it's along the um, along the lines of some of the recent double detent flippers that have come out. They they look it looks like a regular locking uh, flipper knife with the titanium and the super steel, uh, but it will not lock open, and uh, it stays uh, it, it it flips open through that double detent system. So looking forward to seeing who knives for this perfect UK EDC. That's a sub three inch bladed drop point um, that doesn't lock. But uh, I have it on good word here that uh, it does stay open, you know, nicely for a non-locking knife. So it's not gonna close on you. Plus you have that uh, flipper tab right up there near your finger. 
which will which will stop the blade from closing on you. So looking forward to this. Who knives? H O O knives from Carl Pearson, UK based knife enthusiast. So, uh, still to come on the podcast, uh, we take a look at a knife that we've seen before very recently, but it is now mine, all mine. And then we get to my Florida theme park knives coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and let us know. Now, I won't go on for too long about this knife because I've been, I just made a video on it and I've been talking about it and showing it off, but uh, I finally have made it mine. This is the Protec Strider SNG with the G Carta scales and the mother of pearl button. Um, just a beautiful knife. It was on loan to me from uh, Joe, the Knife Whisperer. Joe, it worked. It seems like people know if they get a knife in my hand and then say, want to buy it, I become weak in the knees and I end up buying it. <laughs> don't take that as, a, as, a, as an invitation. I don't need a flood of knives <laughs> coming in. But uh, this one is very unique, very beautiful. This is a kind of a one of a kind. Uh, really, uh, Protec made a number of these SNGs using G Carta and uh, uh, not for nothing, I'm going to be speaking with the head proprietor of G Carta here in a couple of weeks. I'm very excited to talk to him about, about his Micarta um, venture here. But this is called Patriotic G Carta, and you can tell why. But uh, so I've made this 154 cm bladed beauty my own, and I just wanted to mark it here for uh, um, posterity. So when I'm looking back, I can remember when I got it and well, you're along for the ride. I'm not gonna go on forever, but look at this. I love how they've done this integral backstrap thing like uh, Strider does, except they do theirs on the G10 side. They have G10 on this side and it comes all the way over. No backspacer, it's all one integral piece until it hits the metal side. The metal in this case is aluminum. It's not a titanium frame lock as you can see. Um, but I love the way Protec sort of maintained the spirit of the classic Strider build. Still reaching across uh, this way because of my jacked up shoulder. But this thing not only opens and snaps open with authority, uh, but it closes very easily. I'm not sure how they do that, how they make it come out so hard, but go back in so easily. So this is this is it for the state of the collection this week, um, but uh, it is a gorgeous one of a kind, and I'm thrilled to have it. Now the next story is kind of like an extended state of the collection here because, um, well, it's a a story of a road trip. A family takes a road trip. And the father is obsessed with knives and he can't leave home without them because he thinks of all of these possible uh, scenarios where he will need a wide variety of knives. That man is me. And uh, I'm going to tell you and show you what I brought with me. It's probably overkill, but each knife that I brought had a reason. And, um, uh, and some of them had a bit of a funny story. Okay, so I go to a Florida theme park in the Orlando area. There are a number of them. So uh, I'll give you a hint. Wasn't Disney. How's that? Uh, <clears throat> thank God. I'm, I'm told that that is a moral imperative. At some point, if you have children, you got to go there. Uh, I've just been sort of uh, pushing, pushing back. And so I know it'll happen someday. Um, but I rue that day. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Anything to be with my honeys will do. Okay, so my first knife is the Microtech SOCOM Elite. The Microtech SOCOM Elite, ever since I got it, has been my official road trip knife. Why, you ask? It's because of the glass breaker. This was the first folder I ever got with a glass breaker, and um, <clears throat> it has remained my, well, it has remained my road trip knife. I have several others with glass breakers, but some you can't really legally carry through some states, and others are just unwieldy. This is just the perfect road trip knife. And I would venture to say almost the perfect knife in general. 
except for this. <laughs> it is tip down only in this case, which I've never quite understood, but there you have it. Um, so this knife rode in the pocket on the way down. Uh, because I dislocated my shoulder, my wife uh, insisted on driving, and uh, her car is a lot nicer than mine and is in kept, kept in better shape and is kept up at the shop much better than mine, so we decided to go with her car anyway. And she is a stubborn woman. Uh, one of the things I love about her, and so she insisted on driving the entire way, even though at that point, I could uh, I could deal with it. For us, it was a nearly 12-hour drive, so we split it up and stopped in Georgia. Uh, but this was riding in my pocket the whole time and getting a fair amount of, well, not very easy with my left hand, getting a fair amount of uh, use, cutting, cutting open uh, packages in the car of food. Uh, we got some fast food. And so, of course, I'm like, honey, would you like me to cut your hamburger in half? Sure. Oh, got just the thing. So it got a lot of that sort of gratuitous use, um, but just a, 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 a stolen partner in, in, a, in a road trip scenario. Also, it's light. And uh, with this clip and the way it rides, um, it's actually, uh, dare I say, a delightful tip down knife. So this got a lot of carry and use. And at the same time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this over here. At the same time, I was carrying this on that first day. I was carrying my beloved Copus Elvia, Copus Designs, Bladeworks Elvia. This is a knife you've heard me talk about a lot in recent days. Uh, it carries so nicely. It's very, very light. And you have this uh, great sheath. This little hook on the sheath is perfect for dropping in the pocket. And when you pull it out of the pocket, this snags on the snags on the pocket. And uh, if you're lucky, stays in the pocket and you have a knife in hand. Um, oftentimes when I attempt that maneuver, the sheath goes flying out. So I've atta attached this uh, cord to it and I attach it to my, my belt or my belt loop and to ensure that I don't lose the sheath. Now, if I were, if I were going totally covert, you know, say I'm doing some sort of a, some sort of a, you know, criminal deal and I'm undercover, which I'm not, and I don't do any of that stuff, but that, that I think is the purpose of this kind of sheath. You know, even a cord coming out of your pocket could give away that you're carrying a knife or something. Uh, so this sort of hooked sheath uh, really could come in handy. Um, and now I'm speaking seriously to someone who actually needed this, but needed to stash it in a way that it was undetectable. Um, so how I carried this, and this actually ended up being a great way of carrying it in the car, is on the left side, I had, let me stop that from moving. On the left side, I have this uh, debt cord attached to my belt. And instead of dropping it in my pocket, I had it, uh, I had the cord just snaked around uh, in the waistband. And then this just sits nicely uh, behind the button and behind the belt of my pants. So I ima imagine this is, is the, these, uh, this cloth here is a pair of jeans and, uh, and the knife just kind of rides just like this. It sits nicely there. You know that if it pops out, it'll be on the cord. You're not going to lose it altogether. But this knife is so light and so slender uh, that it just, just sits in the, in the waistband just nicely like that. So that's how I had it just in case I needed it for, you know, whatever purpose it's accessible to both the right hand and the left hand. But of course, the way it's set up, uh, this is a Pical style knife. You want it in this grip. So, uh, that, that left-handed carry really works really works nicely. Now, if you're to draw it with your right hand, you'd have that blade up and you have to be careful. You don't cut your belly when you're doing it. I mean, you, you do have to be careful with these reverse edge knives because you have to sort of reverse your instinct with, uh, with certain things like drawing it and well, using it in general. So that was the first day's, uh, travel knife, you know, not something too unusual for me. Um, the next day, I carried the uh, I carried the um, the SOCOM Elite again because we got back in the car and we drove. But my secondary knife was different this time. 
so excited about this uh, recent acquisition that I had to bring it, and that is the Emerson Tiger. I won't go on at length about this because I have uh, done so recently, but this has quickly raced up the ladder as uh, to be my current favorite Emerson. Now I know that will change and you know that's all subject to change, but I've always been a huge fan of the CQC 13 handle and uh, you could pretty much put any blade on it uh, and I would love it, but especially a clip point. And this clip point is uh, very evocative of the CQC 8, which I love, but I, I used to have a full size and a horseman, but I sold them both off in a move that I have now put a moratorium on. There is no more selling of Emerson knives. If, I, if it's in my collection, it's staying in the collection. Uh, so this will cover those bases until, well, until a, a, a full-size CQC8 comes my way for a good price. So I had this on me too. And, you know, you have to, you have to know, I mean, if you've listened to me or seen this, sh uh, this show or any of my videos, uh, my imagination plays a big role in the knives I choose. So to me, this was like, well, I have the SOCOM Elite in case I need to break the glass if we get trapped in the car, but I will need this because uh, if I need to draw the knife quickly, this has such a massive wave. You know, you have to work hard not to wave this knife out. So when you're drawing this knife and you don't want to wave it, you have to sort of grab it like this so that the blade is not uh, is not coming out. And if you can't see what I was just saying, you're kind of covering the, the tail end of the knife with your whole hand so that that blade does not come out. So that was uh, that was day two. And that was also a, uh, a knife I carried in Georgia along with. Now, I didn't check the Georgia knife laws, which was a mistake uh, because uh, uh, because of what I carried on me in Georgia. And, and who knows? Hopefully this worked. Next time I go to Georgia, which will be Blade Show, I will be sure to check the laws. Uh, but this is also another recent acquisition that I'm very pleased with and that carries so well for a nice five-inch um, fixed blade knife. This is the Fred Perrin designed Spyderco Street Bowie with the cognitive dissonance pink and teal uh, cord here, fob, uh, which really aids in drawing this knife. I carry it in the waistband uh, right about three, three o'clock, three thirty, if you will. And uh, I carry it so that it comes out, you grab it uh, like this edge forward and you can pull it out like this and have it in reverse grip. And uh, so I added this cord here just in case my hand is slipping off of this uh, somewhat short handle. And I think the short roundedness of this is what makes it such a great concealed uh, knife or, you know, knife that you wear in the waistband. So it sticks, it doesn't stick in your ribs when you're sitting down and stuff. Uh, but that being said, it is a short handle and you could overshoot and miss it. So I put these two little knots on this cord here so that I could always be sure to grab it uh, and, and make it, uh, make it work. So yeah, I did carry this combination. And uh, I, I, like I said, I'm going to have to check those laws, make sure that I wasn't doing anything too bad and that I don't uh, repeat the mistake in the future if I did. But I felt confident and secure being in an area that I didn't know with these two, two knives. Okay, so this is where it gets interesting. Uh, so far, you've seen me just talk about four knives I've talked about in the past and, uh, you know, just carrying them. But we get to the theme park. And the next day, we go into the theme park and I say, baby, no need to carry that in your bag. I'll carry my backpack. We can just put all of our stuff in my in my backpack and I'll hump it around all day. You know, that was me being generous. Well, no, not generous. That was me being a dad. You know, I'll carry all the stuff. That's cool. I don't need my little girls fettered with uh, bottles of water and, and all that. So, but I had an ulterior motive. Uh, I wanted to be able to have my first aid kit, my, uh, my, all my little special survival stuff on me, uh, least of which are the knives. Um, but I knew that we were going to be going through some sort of security. So, uh, so I kept it light. I didn't bring the big fixed blade. I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, bring anything too egregious. 
But uh, my wife was like, yeah, if you, if you need to bring in a pocket knife, I understand. Just drop it in the bottom of the bag. Uh, you know, they're not going to dig through it. They've got a, they've got a line of people to look through. So I was like, okay, that's if, 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 you know, if Mrs. Knife Junkie says that that's cool, that's cool because if she didn't, and then I got busted trying to bring a knife in, there'd be big trouble. So on that first day I took, uh, I took the, I took the, um, uh, so commonly dropped it in the very bottom of my bag and then removed almost all the knives from my bag. Uh, except for this one, this one made it through the check and I'm pretty sure, uh, this was seen. Uh, it was, uh, the, the top little, uh, top little zipper pouch was unzippered and, uh, she was using a little poker to poke around and I, I saw it. I'm not sure if she saw and recognized what this is. This is a Swiss army knife, as you can see, a Victorinox. Now, I don't know what model this is. My brother gave it to me. I think it's a Mountaineer. I think it's a Mountaineer. It has the file on it. Um, and the only thing it doesn't have is that grocery bag hook thing on the bottom, uh, which would make it a Mountaineer. So I really, frankly, don't know what model this is. I was pouring over uh, Blade HQ and the Victorinox site, and I, I couldn't find this exact knife. I'm not sure if it was a special order for whatever company this was. Uh, but this is, this is always in my backpack. This is an awesome Swiss army knife. And, uh, uh, it was a gift that my brother gave me when he sold me his fender precision base. And, uh, this was left in the case. And I very coyly said, Hey Vic, uh, you accidentally left a knife in the base case. He said, that's yours now, Bob. So I said, Hey, if I must. And so forevermore, it's been riding in my writing in my uh, thing. So this made it through, which I was very happy, happy to have on me because it is a do all kind of knife. You know, it's got the awesome scissors figured if we were buying hats and sunglasses and that kind of stuff, it'd be nicer to just take out the little scissors and clip the things than to be whipping out the SOCOM elite to cut the, uh, to cut the, um, to cut those tags. SOCOM elite ended up coming out and going in the waistband. I didn't want people to see the clip. Uh, but that rode very nicely in the waistband. Okay, so that made it through the first day, as did the next two. Well, you know what? So two others made it through that day. The second day, we show up to the uh, security booth, and I'm like, hmm, uh, this doesn't look as good as it did yesterday. Um, we had one guy that looked like he just got back, you know, just got out of the military and another guy who looked like he got out of the military like 30 years ago and they were doing security. And I was like, hmm, this this might not go as well as yesterday, but let's let's just see. So we go up and I put the backpack down. And my first mistake or one of my first mistakes was that my backpack is black tactical 511, you know, Molly webbing all over it. And uh, it's a great backpack. Uh, but it looks like the kind of backpack a guy who's trying to sneak knives into a theme park would carry. So I put it down on the on the on the bag and just sort of like make small talk. Hey man, how's it going? How's it, is it crowded today? How do the rides look? Is it going to be a lot of wait times? You know, uh, trying to be kind of a babe in the woods. And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and he unzips the bag, and the first thing he sees is this. These are my work keys. They live in my backpack. I forgot I even had them. This guy keys into my Swiss, <laughs> my Victorinox classic with this giant and menacing blade on it. And he's like, you're not allowed to bring that in here. And I was like, oh God, this is not going to go well. If, 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 he's, if he's reacting this way to my little unthreatening clear blue plastic Victorinox classic, uh, I, I'm in trouble. And then he sees this one and he's like, <clears throat> okay, you can't bring this one in either. And he, and then just as a tour, I think he wanted to see what else he was going to find. I mean, cause I should have just turned around right there. Be right back. Uh, and then he gets to this, the Victor, uh, the, um, the wing, the Leatherman wingman. And he's like, you can't bring that in. And I'm like, sir, that's just a Leatherman. You know, that's just a, it's a tool. It's a ply, it's pliers, you know? And he's like, you know, as well as I, it's got a knife on it. And I was like, oh yeah, 
yeah, I guess it does, you know? I guess it does. And I'm like, what, can we not bring anything metal into this place? I didn't say that. But uh, I, I was kind of advocating for myself, trying to say, like, it's just a tool, man. What, are you going to take this away from me? And the guy said, well, you can go back to the hotel and put it there or stash it in your car. Or you can leave it here, but you won't get it back. And I laughed at him. I was like, are you serious, man? You think I'm going to leave it here? This is not a gift that I intended to give to you. So at this point, my wife and daughters, who are just dying to get into the theme park, are staring a hole in me. Like, really? Is it everywhere we go we have to go through this? Um, I learned my airport lesson the hard way a couple of times. Uh, but theme parks, how often do I go to a theme park? So, so the Leatherman was there, and I had to, uh, at that point, I turned around. I'm like, I will be right back. I made it a very quick trip back to the hotel room because I, I didn't want to, I didn't want the wrath of three females to come down on me over this. So I run back up and uh, return those to the hotel room. I come back down. I'm like, okay, all the knives are expunged from this bag. I, I removed the SOCOM Elite. It's like, you know, I, I don't want them to find this. Like on a second search, then I'm really up, uh, up the creek. It's going to look like I'm intending to do something bad. And uh, they're going to take it. And this guy's going to be like, honey, look at what I got today. I got a SOCOM Elite. Uh, so dropped everything off. Go back down with my bag. The guy does a, it starts a very thorough search again. And this bag has a lot of pockets. I'm like, this is not your usual like, hmm, okay, go ahead, kind of search that we experienced the day before. This guy is unzipping every, I think he was admiring the bag. Like, I got to get one of these backpacks. This is pretty awesome. And he's going through everything. And I'm like, oh no, he pulls this out. This is my little Maxpedition um, safety kit. I keep it in the I keep it in the in my bag. It's got a screwdriver here, but it's got all this stuff I might need. A lighter, a flashlight, a spoon, a first aid kit. It had this. He missed this. This is the uh, um, Leatherman squirt that I forgot was in there. And uh, I'm like, oh, don't, 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 don't. And he looked right at it and didn't say anything. And then he was having a hard time unzipping it because luckily I have jam packed this thing with stuff and, and there was a line growing and I'm growing self-conscious. And I think he was too. I was like, we got to move this line along. And I had forgotten that in there, in that survival kit, I keep this little K bar dozier, mini K bar dozier knife. He didn't see it. Thank the heavens above, because I'd really be in trouble. I'd still be in the doghouse right now. Um, so he zipped it back up and threw it in. He's like, ah, survival kit. We all need one of these. And I, I was like, you're right, sir. You never know what's going to happen. And I have first aid in there in case I have to administer aid to um, one of my family members or, or my fellow man, because that's the kind of swell guy I am. He zips it up, throws it in the bag, and we walk by. And I got to say... I breathed a sigh of relief because, you know, I think two strikes, they'd be like, what are you trying to do here? So very unintentionally, this sub three inch knife was my carry that day. Took it out, uh, put it in the waistband so no one would see the clip and carried this thing around all day. And uh, I don't think I used it for anything, but it was there and it made me feel secure. This is this is the state I have come to. Um, if I don't have a knife on me, I feel naked. It's it's that old um, cliche. I really do. I, I I feel unprepared without some sort of cutting edge on me. And and as I mentioned, I didn't use it for anything. It's not like I have all these cutting tasks uh, coming my way all the time. It's just knowing that it's there makes a huge difference. So thank God this guy was not, you know thorough to the to the bone he missed this and i got it through and i i was in the theme park with a knife not intending to do anything bad and and this guy was a great security guy and the, and the lady before him was awesome i'm not trying to get anyone in trouble that's why i'm not mentioning the theme park uh but i was glad i had this on me this 
is a great little knife. I don't know if you have one of these, if you've seen these. I, I learned about this knife from Nut and Fancy years ago. This was a little survival kit knife for him. It's a great little lockback. It's just got FRN handles, no liners. It's light as the day is long. It's got jimping right here on the blade. Really, really excellent jimping. Thumb stud. Let me get some focus there. Thumb stud open just on one side, which is kind of interesting to me. Sort of an antiquated thing. And uh, and a really nice OS 8A blade. Uh, blade. It's made in Taiwan, and I have a. I have good experience with knives made in Taiwan. They, they usually end up being excellent. So I was happy to have this thing on me. I had the little, this little uh, 420 cord, 420 bro. I think this is 420, 320 cord, uh, hanging out the side of my waist. Had it covered with the shirt, easy access in case I needed it, which I didn't. Uh, so uh, that's what I had. I had one more because I'm not going to go all the way out of state. I'm not going to travel through one, two, three. I'm not going to travel through three states to get to a fourth and not have something substantial on me. So I had all these. This is good. This is good. But what happens if, mm, say, there is some sort of a car accident, heaven forbid, and uh, I have to break us out with the SOCOM elite, and then we find ourselves in the boggy, swampy woods of Georgia, or South Carolina, what am I going to have on my belt? You know, I know I'm going to have in the waistband, I'll have the Spyderco, I'll have my Emerson, I'll have my LV, I'll have all the other stuff, you know, on me in case those needs arise. But what about a real knife? What, what am I going to do for a real knife? So I brought an old favorite. I brought the Topps Prather War Bowie, riding in the best Kydex sheath I've ever made, by the way. Um, so I figured if anything real came up, anything that I would need a, a real big honker of a knife, this would do the trick. Uh, as you probably imagined, I, I vacillated on what the big knife would be. I knew it would be a Bowie, uh, but I always bring a big knife when I travel. I used to always travel with, the, um, with my Cold Steel Tanto, and then that turned into the SOG Super Bowie. And then in recent years, it's been... Um, either my Trailmaster, my Vaquero, or this. And I figured the Trailmaster and the Vaquero were just a little bit too much, just in length. So I, uh, I opted for the Prather War Bowie. And having this quarter inch thick slab of steel in my bag, well, it was in the car. It stayed in the car most of the time. Just made me feel like it's all gonna be okay. If I need a big knife, I got my bases covered. Um, one thing I love about this knife, besides everything, is, uh, well, I love that beautiful long swedge. Kind of wish it was sharpened, but that's not what this is about. Um, this is more of an all-arounder. So having that sharpened would uh, very much reduce its usefulness as a woodland knife or a, or a, or a um, like a wood processing knife or whatever. Uh, but something I love about this knife that I also love about the Fred Perrin design and most of Fred Perrin's designs. Now, if you don't know who Fred Perrin is, he's a, a former French commando, uh, martial arts champion, colleague guy who designs and makes knives of his own. And most of them have this sort of um, feature here. Uh, and it's, in, for him, inspired by French... French knives, French uh, fighting knives, and French belt knives, which also incidentally look a lot like French cooking knives. And that is a handle um, coming, uh, narrowing and terminating at the blade and using the blade itself as the guard um, so that you don't run up onto the, onto the blade or you know whatever you need a knife guard for. But instead of putting uh, quillions on there, uh, it's the blade itself that is the guard. So that's one thing I've always loved about this Prather War Bowie, Bowie Bowie. And um, not for nothing, but this also has the classic tops treatment. You've got the beautiful, uh, this is linen micarta. You can tell it's linen because of the tight weave. Canvas has the thicker weave. 
and uh, they have their uh, Rocky Mountain Tread on here. This is a, a really great texture. Got the black or the red liners against the black. You have that nice jimping. And uh, well, I just feel like uh, I feel like this is a very very capable knife, but it's in a, a somewhat short package for a, for a fixed blade. It's got the seven inch blade. It's sort of uh, it sort of in that realm of combat classic uh, in terms of its dimensions. Wait, is this seven inch? Hang on. Yeah, seven and a half inch blade. So yeah, it's right around the the K bar length and the and the um, and the Randall made model one length, and uh, but just has a robustness uh, that I wouldn't mind thrashing on. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Bob, that's 1095 steel. Why would you bring 1095 steel by choice down into such a humid area like like Georgia and Florida and those uh, and those areas? Well, I say. I, I have trust in that black traction coating that Topps put on there, puts on their 1095 steel, and uh, you know experienced no rust on the edge for the short period of time I was there. Of course, it is springtime; wasn't very humid. Uh, we had beautiful weather, but in any case, it did not uh, it did not affect the knife at all. So let me know: Have you ever had an experience like this? Um, you show up to a concert. I went to a Tool concert. Uh, during their lat lateralis tour in like 2002 in Connecticut and had a knife on me like an idiot. I mean, come on. I, I don't go to that many concerts, but I should have known and uh, ran into the same thing, had to stash the knife in a, in a, in a planter, got it back. Same thing uh, with the uh, art museums. Um, sometimes I'll roll up and I'm like, I'm not sure if they're checking and they are. And so got to go back outside, find a planter or something and kind of stick it in. I've done that plenty of times with the, um, with the, uh, what is, uh, with the pink broken skull that has seen a few, a few bits of public dirt. Um, but thankfully it's always been there when I've returned to get it. So have you had this situation? I know, uh, when Dr. Frankie was on the show, he had a great story, a heartbreaking story of going to the Staten Island ferry, uh, in New York to, uh, to go out and see the Statue of Liberty. Uh, if you're going to New York, I don't know if they still do this, but you can get a free trip around uh, near the Statue of Liberty just by getting on the ferry to Staten Island. Um, but anyway, he did that and he had a uh, Peter Rosenti Nirvana on him and he stashed it. And when he came back, it was gone. <laughs> Heartbreaking story. I know a lot of people gave him a lot of crap for that, but I admired him telling it because it's the kind of thing we all do. Is it not? Don't don't we do stupid knife things sometimes? I used to feature a uh, um, I used to ask the question of people on the show um, to to tell a stupid knife story, and I've sort of trailed off of that, kind of have forgotten about that. Maybe I'll get back to that, but I have a lot of them, and uh, some of them have to do with with that uh, sort of stashing of knives. So let me just wrap this episode up by saying um, I don't condone bringing knives into areas you're, you're not supposed to. Um, I know what's in my heart. I know that I intend no ill will towards anyone or any property or anything. And my carrying a knife into a, into a theme park where I'm not supposed to have it is not an act of disobedience. Uh, I guess it is, but it's not a, I'm not doing it to like thumb my nose at the man or anything like that. I, I really do feel like I should be able to have a knife on me in case something comes up where I need it. Um, but man, uh, next time I'll do it maybe a little, a little bit better, a little more discreetly, and uh, and and maybe with knives that are slightly less menacing. You know, uh, you uh, the pink broken skull. That's you know the pink knives, the orange happy blue looking knives, the the blue handled knives, that kind of thing might go over better. But then again, this little blue handled knife didn't go over well. I cannot believe that I was ejected for this little thing. So anyway, I will leave it there for this episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. Check out all of our other uh, podcasts and great interviews. And when I say great interview, I really mean the great people we interview. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back for my interviewing skills. Um, but I am saying we talked to some outstanding people on this show who have taught me so much about this uh, knife obsession we all have. So 
go back in the backlog, check it out. As I mentioned earlier, we had Laren Thomas on the show. Uh, he was episode number 13. What an interesting guy. I kind of just let him talk because I don't, uh, chemistry. I didn't get it in high school. Still don't get it. Even when I, uh, even when I, even when I put it in the context of knives, it's still over my head. So check out our backlog of, of episodes and uh, let me know in the comments below if you've had any sort of experience like this and how you've, uh, how you've dealt with it. Um, we had a great trip. Thank God we returned safely. And uh, well, I guess I'll leave it right there. Thanks for watching the Knife Junkie podcast and listening. And we will check you out here next week. Until then. I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.